Hello and welcome to the ninth instalment of this exciting series of shows sponsored by Dublin City Comics and Collectibles where we, the full force, take an in-depth look at the old Action Force comics in no particular order. For this beauty we are delving into the one that started it all in the pages of Battle Action Force. Action Force it's called. I am Chris Mouton McLeod, aka Diagnostic 80, and joining me on this new episode, as always, is Brian, all mouth and no action force, Hickey. So let's get on with it, shall we? Explosion. For this episode, we decided to look at the comic story that started it all in the pages of battle. The first story of Action Force! Originally published in 1983 over four issues of Battle, numbers 422, 423, 424, and 425. Oh, I thought it was going to be 428. <laughs> the credits include writer Jerry Day, artist Jim Watson, and letterer Peter Knight. What a creative team right there. Amazing. Bangers. The cast include... The people, Prime Minister and Chief of Police of Ascendancy Island. For the Red Shadows, we have Baron Ironblood, Black Major, Red Laser, Red Vulture, Red Shadow Troops and Mouton! UN Council Members, Possible Action Force Commander. Q-Force, we have the Aqua Trooper, codenamed Shark, Deep Sea Defender and Commander, codenamed Leviathan, and Sonar Officer, codenamed Bones. For Space Force, we have Commander, codenamed Sky Raider, Pilot, codenamed Hot Jets, and Patroller, codenamed Blastoff. SAS Force also make an appearance with Squad Leader, codenamed Eagle, and a host of SAS troops. And finishing up, we have the Z Force, Commander, codenamed Skip, Radio Operator, codenamed Breaker, Battle Tank, Commander, codenamed Steeler, Sapper, codenamed Tracker, and Z Force troops. Vehicles. We've got our Red Shadows landing craft, Shadow Track, and the Laser Exterminator. Q Force weigh in with the Swordfish, Stingray, and the Q Force Submarine. While Space Force cover the skies with their Cosmic Cruiser and the Space Force Orbital Base. And finally, again, Z Force with their landing craft, battle tank, and Jeep. Yes, we'll see that Jeep go <laughs> later. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Story synopsis. This is the first comic story to feature the Action Force and Red Shadows characters, and it starts on the remote island of Ascendancy in the Southern Hemisphere, one of the world's newest and smallest states. The peaceful tranquility is shattered when Red Shadows landing craft invade the island, killing a number of people, including the Prime Minister and Chief of Police, despite their pleas to the Black Major to show them mercy. Interesting name for this island, isn't it? Kind of remind and the whole like idea reminds me of Cobra Island, even though it came about in a different way. But it's just this kind of like small piece of land that the bad guys are now, you know, in command of. So looking at the little sketch of Ascendancy Island, it is reminiscent of mm. Cobra Island, yeah, for sure. Is, yeah, For sure. This is not the last time, obviously, that we, we hear of Ascendancy Island because when Battle rebrands in a few issues time to Battle Action Force, yeah. one of the f- first stories that they come out with is uh, Operation Bloodhound and Action Force will ultimately be based from on Ascendancy Island as they pursue Baron Ironblood all across the South American continent. That's a very good point that you mentioned that, actually. I mean, for, the, for any that aren't aware, it wasn't always just Battle Action Force. This Action Force story was included basically as a marketing ploy by the Action Force toy manufacturers, Palatoy, at the time, getting in league with, uh, was it IPC? IPC, yeah, IPC would have been the, IPC magazines would have owned Battle and a number of other publications. Yeah. So they kind of kind of joined forces to get this, I suppose, like long form advertisement, advertisement out there in their pages of Battle, but it, it proved so popular that Battle decided just to completely rebrand as Battle Action Force, which I think is like, quite hilarious in a way it's like you know like this was such a big hit at the time that they were like no we have to keep this going and it has to be the main story that features in our comics yeah and we actually got some amazing because this was so successful we got some amazing 
content, some great stories, great characters brought to life. And some of the, you know, as we've already covered on this show, some of the greats of the British comic industry of mm. that time working with the Action Force franchise. So we were spoiled, absolutely spoiled, Ron. And we didn't know it at the time, but we were. I should also say, because it was a short story, we also got this in full colour, but we have no idea who did the colours. So if anyone out there knows who did the colouring for this particular run of of the of issues uh especially for this particular story then obviously let us know and we will retcon that into the next episode but yeah um i suppose we also see how ruthless the red shadows are from the off again and and surprising to see the pm and and chief of police like die off panel for a change because i suppose as we get deep into battle action force it gets really brutal doesn't it and th- that isn't ex- necessarily the thing here because it's off panel that they die but you know you've got um I mean, we've covered this before stories like johnny red and charlie's war are gritty war stories and and they don't hold back on the violence i mean they're not really for kids when you look at them now albeit that this was a kid's comic back in the day. And <laughs> and that level of violence carried forth into the, the action force stories as well. Yeah. They didn't hold back. But it is unusual here, maybe because this is um, a piece of content marketing for children's toys, that the Black Major executes these guys off panel and you just see presumably the chief of police already dead and then it's the, the prime minister yeah. in his kind of death throes before he... he he, you know, he's gone. So they've watered it down a little bit here uh, in this particular case. Yeah. If you even look at the the covers for the issues that were that that this story was printed in, there's one cover there which has the invasion 1984 story on the front cover, and it's Piccadilly Square in flames. Yeah, pretty intense. Dead bodies all over the place. Uh, aliens rampaging across the, across London, and we see a, a you know a British Army soldier on his walkie-talkie, basically saying, "London has fallen. We've lost the war. We're dead." I wonder if that's Gerard Butler. <laughs> <laughs> all those movies he's done with like <laughs> i think angel has fallen now is a new one. Oh, that's it yeah yeah but it's <laughs> it's indicative of the kind of violence that was that was in these that was in these stories and this was fighting for you know, on a news agent's shelf they're fighting for real station fighting mm. for attention with punters these were certainly eye-catching covers really eye-catching and again i suppose you're not selling well you're selling it to kids effectively here i don't think the mom's necessarily going to pick this up and go oh yeah this is going to be good for for my little jack or something so um yeah it's an interesting um ploy but i suppose it was slightly different back then because i don't think people really gave two craps about if, if something was drawn in a cartoon form you could pretty much get away with with murder on the front of a comic um, literally literally coming back to the actual story though iron blood informs the united nations in new york that he has taken over the island and its inhabitants and he will set off a super bomb unless his demands for 400 million dollars in gold bars are met the members of the un discuss the matter and decide to contact action force a special forces team that all of the countries in the un have supplied members for so yeah not much backstory for action force here but we can ascertain that they were created by the un as an international special forces group comprises of members from all over the world. And I suppose we get to see that later on in the Battle Action Force comics when they start exploring the lore a bit. Yeah, so uh, I mean, obviously they've got a very small amount of real estate. I mean, we're talking a total of 12 pages over the course of four issues. Mm. And they have to introduce so many characters, like all of our Action Force squads, yeah. all the bad guys, cramming as many characters and vehicles as possible. So... By way of a backstory, we really only get two small panels that say it's an international force, and uh, we, we get a, maybe a little bit of a hint at possibly the, the action force commander. That's really cool, isn't it? Yeah, because, what? Well, so we got it in 1982 as a mail away, later became the Z Force commander as another mail away the following year, so it would have been like right in the wheelhouse of them wanting that like a character out there you know in print as well as in toy form so it's quite possible that that was their intention that this this commander in this issue is that kind of mail away kit bash type you know figure i think that's a pretty safe call to make and like and as we'll see a little bit further on there's obviously a lot of they had a lot of source material, the creative team to work with. So there's a lot, a lot of kind of references in there that we, that you know, to the toys mm. and maybe some of the promotional material for the toys as well. 
that's actually true yeah we, as we do as when we do move on there are some really cool nods to like almost prototypes but yeah so q4 so the first team to be activated and managed to recon the island capture red shadow for interrogation but he swallows a cyanide pill hidden in his tooth and kills himself <laughs> it's like there are so many kind of I suppose like stereotypes in the in the terrorist spy kind of genre going on here. I'm um, like there's the the super bomb, there's the fact that um, that you know you've got this, these bad guys with with helmets and masks and like, you know, and all that kind of stuff and then you've got these guys taking cyanide pills. All kind of classic sort of, you know, bad guy stuff, you know, from from TV shows of, of the time. The cyanide pill, I mean, we've seen it done a thousand times and it's not the last time we're going to see it in, in Battle Action Force. Oh, there's also the ransom for one million dollars as well, like that kind of <laughs> Dr. Evil sort of vibe going on. It's really, really funny. Uh, we're also introduced to the Action Force team by team, starting off with uh, Q-Force. So we get to see, uh, well, we're given like first names, you know, shark and phones called by their file names, basically. And Le- Leviathan, you can tell because he's got a Scottish accent. So... You know, that's he's the only one of uh, Q Force from Scotland. Plus, he's the commander, so it makes sense. So you can kind of ascertain that those are the the guys that we're dealing with at the moment. That's a that's a good way of kind of revealing the international nature of the force. Yeah. So you know, Jean Claude is very obviously. You would assume it's not an Irish or an English name. <laughs> that this that no, it, it's going to be you know French or Belgian or something like that. Even if you don't necessarily know everything about the character. Yeah. We have McLaren's Scottish accent is coming out. You know, got you laddie so it's you know it's it's an indication that you know he's he's you know from the the, the scottish or british side of the um the forces so it's a it's a nice way of without relying on the code names because the code names yeah. would reveal nothing really yeah, yeah. um they're, they're kind of getting that international nature in there that's a very good point and also i, I wonder if the code names were in place by at this stage like whether because i'm not sure what came out first whether this came out in like around the same time as the as the figures were launched or after the figures were launched or before the figures were launched so it's hard to gauge i mean obviously if we've got we've got a date on the issues we, we'd know but i don't know off the top of my head what came first it does strike me though that they're using visual reference that definitely points towards prototype vehicles and toys and i'll explain that a little bit later on and then there's also you know so there's a few things that you know obviously this was probably in planning alongside the action force stuff so possibly the the names when it got down to the writing part or the you know even the kind of like putting it together as a story maybe the the code names weren't in place at that stage you never know but i'm you know i i would guess that they weren't in place and that it was just a matter of uh, too much work to change it by the time they came out plus they kind of weren't really let they, they didn't lead with the code names in the toys necessarily that was always like a almost like a hidden thing in the file card wasn't it that's right you kind of had to kind of dig a little bit for that i mean they they used the code names a lot in when it becomes in the, yeah in the force. comics yes and yeah. in the comics it's, i mean it's all code names but um it was always yeah, like deep to... sea defender or like you know like they would they went on the front of the card it just explained what they did as opposed to what then not their you know their names were like it wasn't it wasn't Eagle on the front of the SAS Squad Leaders card. It was SAS Squad Leader. So, yeah, you're right. It's like that kind of having to dig for that information. And, and it like, yeah, so it, it does make a hell of a lot of sense that they do that with the with the file names anyway. And it kind of gives you that, yeah, that kind of this is a global team kind of thing. So with a suitable invasion landing plan in place, thanks to Q-Force, Space Force strategically positioned their orbital satellite base over the island for intelligence gathering purposes. However, a Red Shadow mobile tracking post picks them up and Red Laser is ordered to fire his laser exterminator at the orbiting space station. Yeah. Here we get an unmasked Baron, even though we've you know we've seen him on the cover already. <laughs> I mean, straight out out of the you know out of the traps. A f- front cover is unmasked. You get him in this kind of first story, the first part of the story, he's unmasked. And we probably never see him unmasked again, except for maybe a file card that appears yeah. in, in um, Operation Bloodhound. He's almost always masked after that. And it, that's a weird one because the toy, yeah. the helmet's removable. It's like there's no mystery about who, who, what his face looked like. But um, 
after this story, they seemed hesitant to show him unmasked again. It's almost like they were backpedaling with it because they didn't, that you know, they wanted it to be maybe like a cool reveal, even though like the toy, you know, doesn't even have it on his head in the packaging. Like there's, it's almost like they missed, they, they missed the boat on the mysterious aspect of it. And then once the figures were already out, and the new comic was out there and stuff. They just kind of, well, let's just keep him hidden and a bit mysterious kind of thing. So it is it is a funny one. It's almost like a bit of a mistake they tried to backpedal on and then didn't realise that, well, everyone knows what it looks like. It's everywhere, you know. <laughs> but it's interesting. He, he was always reminded me of like a, I would say like an old Sean Connery, but he actually reminds me of a young Sean Connery in some of his earlier stuff, like Highlander. And there was a film just oh, before yeah. Highlander that he did that he looks the spitting image of the Baron in this story and on the cover. It's hilarious. Do you know, that that is abs- absolutely right. Sean Connery, my God, he's a, he's a ringer for a kind of a, a, a middle-aged Sean Connery. Isn't it? Also, a lot of the visuals were clearly based on prototypes, as I mentioned earlier on, of the toys. The Cosmic Cruiser has that turbine on the top that wasn't included in the retail release of the vehicle, but was seen in, like, a number of catalogue images. It's also shown without the tilting skids underneath uh, underneath it, as if they imagined that the landing gear would appear when in landing mode. So it was almost like, well, that's the landing gear, so obviously we can't have it on show, so we'll just we'll draw it without the landing gear on. It's kind of funny. We discussed a previous Battle Action Force, uh, the, the story Attack, where we just saw Mouton was featured in that without any of his accessories. Yeah, yeah. So the artist was given... You know, reference that of, of the figure with it, any of the with all the removable parts removed. Yeah, yeah. Maybe something similar happened here when uh, Jim Watson was working on this. It didn't have any landing gear on it, and so he just drew it as he as he saw it. That is a very good point because he may not have been working from photo reference. That's another good point. So it may have been like, what have we got to? You know, does any do we have a cosmic cruiser to send him? Yeah, we've got one here, but it's a bit knackered. Send him that. He can, you know, he'll work it. Work, he'll work it out, kind of thing. So that is that is a good point. He could have just had, yeah, he could have easily have had just the prototype from Toy Fair that may have been broken or taken to pieces for for transport or something. So yeah, that's that is a good point actually. And also we see the orbital base is modelled on the kit bash dio they created for the product catalogues and the Toy Fairs. And oh, it's this is amazing. So amazing. Like it's it's so funny. Like the the one that they did for the for the toy fair is oh in actual fact, do you know what? Do you know what I think is I think he was working from from photo reference because you can't see the landing gear clearly in that one shot. That's right. So yes, it, it's yes. It's definitely the fact he's working from photo reference. He can't see the landing gear and Bob's your uncle. He's drawn the orbital base like that and he's drawn the you know the cosmic cruiser with the turbine on it and no landing gear because he can't see it that is exactly when you see the panel of the orbital base being hit I'll flash it up uh, as with, well. with the laser coming out from ascendancy island it's exactly what's in the toy catalog it's exactly that even where the the cosmic cruiser is positioned in the landing bay yeah. is exactly the same yeah it's really cool i mean that would have been a cool little set like a space force hq would have been cool wouldn't it like an orbital space platform much like the HQ, the cardboard HQ they brought out for Z Force, you know, or just the, you know the Action Force HQ. I think that would have been really cool to have that as a toy. This actually it does remind me a, a little bit of the, I say the cardboard Action Force HQ, or even the cardboard Palatoy Death Star. Big time. I wonder if it's a kit bash from the Death Star. In actual fact, I do you know the could, could be a bit of that. Uh, it, it's it seems to follow a similar kind of structure with the. You know, the two tier level, but but it would have made a superb toy. You know yeah, that could have been just wicked. worked up. It's it's beautiful. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to know more about that. It's great, and I'll flash all that up for everyone on on sh- on the screen as well, so you get to see both. You lucky lucky people. <laughs> <laughs> you lucky lucky. The team are forced to move out of orbit, but not before they've completed the other part of their plan to parachute drop SAS force troops led by Eagle onto the island. It's like the first ever. What was that guy that did the drop from the red, like the Red Bull? I forget his name now. I feel really bad because it was amazing. He jumped from like a, you know, from orbit and did a free fall. That's right. Yeah, that was. Um, I don't know the guy's name. I've completely forgotten his name. I'm, I'm an idiot. I'll flash up on screen. But anyway, yeah. This is kind of the the, the SAS force signature move here. So uh, the SAS invented the halo 
jump to the high altitude low opening jump yeah that was invented by uh, the sas so Nutters. this is this is jerry day really you know giving it a nod to the real sas with this method for secretly getting access to ascendancy island coolsies if you can hear any snoring on the uh, on the episode by the way i'm not sure if you can or not i'll have to check in audio it's because my dog max he's not feeling too great so he's on my lap in a little bed on my lap as i record oh. this podcast so if he's snoring i might even just leave it in just for the cute factor but he's uh, yeah he's kind of he's snoring away underneath me max has to stay we can't quote max yeah, he's got to stay so i'll keep max's lines in don't worry uh, <laughs> even though the Baron thinks he has covered every single centimetre, he says centimetre, of coastline around the island, SAS force begin to land, Z force landing craft start their own invasion, and the battle commences. We get our first Wilhelm scream. Yay! Aye! <laughs> what? Why don't they just leave when battle for when a- when action force attack? Why don't they just get off the island, knowing? fully well what they've got planted and and sorted out for them yeah i mean like they didn't need to hang around and fight this duke this out with the lads but that said it wouldn't have been much fun for us the readers no. we can get this big battle this is like in all those kind of classic connery bond movies there's always a massive battle at the end of the movie this is what we're getting here now the action force are going in all guns blazing it's a huge uh the storm in the beach you know massive uh, amount of landing craft and the Red Shadows are going to put up a phenomenal fight against Action Force. And it's uh, it makes for great reading, great action, but not the smartest move by Baron Arnblood. No, it really wasn't. But anyway, yeah, you're right, though, obviously. There's, you can't just have them leave and blow the place up and then it's over, because that would be the <laughs> worst way to market these toys ever. And all of SAS and Z-Force die, you know, like straight away. Um, <laughs> so... I mean, and another thing that, that, that kind of made me know, something that, that I noticed was that you don't have Z-Force infantrymen, you just have a ton of skips. They're all wearing berets, so it's really hard to identify skip in that particular. And now my other dog's in here playing with a, with a toy, so brilliant. Um, <laughs> so I'm leaving all of this in here. She's going to be squeaking a toy and he's going to be snoring, so brilliant. So yeah, they don't have the infantrymen. I wonder if that's because it wasn't available at that, at that stage it wasn't part of their plans and maybe they didn't have that reference so they just had that skip figure and they thought well let's just do these as z force troops you know but you know this reminds me of a couple of years previous i had a sticker book an action man sticker book and you, you collect the stickers you put them in the the, you know, the blank panels in the book but they they actually told a story right? so they you were basically collecting the panels for a comic strip yeah. in sticker format and the action man paratrooper figure was featured a lot throughout this particular sticker book and a lot of the stories and that's what this reminds me of here mm. the z force troops like the, the british paratrooper look with the red beret it, it reminds me very much of that particular uh, series of stories that were in that sticker book cool also it's the same the similar thing happens with the ss as well obviously you've got tons of guys rocking the eagle look as well so but obviously that was you know, that was what the SAS looked like during the Iranian embassy siege. So you can kind of forgive that in a sense, can't you? Yeah, I mean, that, that's their battle fatigues. I'm guessing the Red Beret wouldn't be typical sort of battle fatigue no. for, for even the, the paratroopers that have hard hats and stuff. Yeah. With Red Shadow Forces dug in and picking off targets with the laser exterminator, Z Force bring in Steeler and the battle tank to even the odds. Steeler manages to avoid getting hit by the laser and successfully destroys the Red Shadow's best chance of holding their position. Here's your jeep getting blown up as well. (laughs) It's just off the landing craft, straight onto the beach and... Gone. Do we even... I don't even think we see it other than as it's been blown up. Do we even get like a shot of it not blown up? I can't even remember. I I, I don't think we do get to see it. Now, it, it may not specifically be the Z-Force Jeep. It could just be the bog standard Action Force Jeep, which was repainted later as the Z-Force Jeep. Yeah, true. Again, it, but, would, uh, it would be whatever reference they had as well, wouldn't it? So with Action Force homing in on the super bomb, Iron Blood decides to activate a remote connection with Mouton as Action Force unearthed the bomb 
bomb, the Mouton emerges from the ground underneath and begins to bring the device to the Baron. This is fantastic. I mean, this is great. The guys are digging it. They've, they've located the bomb. We actually have this little a bit of interplay between SAS Force and Z Force. The kind of the bit of bravado from the two squads as they're, they're kind of looking for the bomb. SAS Force is saying, you took your time getting here, lads, didn't you? And Z Force say, well, you took your time finding the bomb. We've <laughs> already found it. So uh, they're digging the bomb out and someone says uh hey there's a problem here the bomb is stuck it's 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 not coming out and as they reveal it they reveal more of the bomb there's a hand gripping it and as they dig out some more it's muton <laughs> buried i kind of feel like muton was never utilized as well as say the bats were utilized in the gi joe comics and 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 media and I always thought, like, you know, like an army of Moutons would be way more, like, scary and more practical and a little bit, you know, mindless droney. And they, they don't really utilise them that often, do they, or the Mouton? It doesn't, doesn't get that much love in the comics. There's only a few appearances I can think of. No, I mean, he, he gets a few appearances, but as you say, he's totally under you know, underused for, for, you know, an android that is practically indestructible. Yes. It would make sense to bring, you know, even a squad of them into play would wreck havoc. They'd smashed their way through the Z Force, uh, you know, front lines, decimate the, the attack on Ascendancy Island. It's kind of a no-brainer to bring these guys out. And you see, like, in, in more recent times, how, you know, writers like Larry Hammer who's brought the Mouton into play in some of his stories. Yeah, yeah. And he's used them very effectively, albeit as a single character. But uh, there's there's a missed opportunity there. We we never have never seen a squad or an army of mutons come into play, and that would really challenge the good guys. So how do you take down an army of indestructible androids? I suppose if you if you did it so that obviously like you know you can you can if it's going to be indestructible and really hardcore, then it, it makes sense. It'd be very expensive to build and all that kind of stuff. I get that. They could always shave that part of the. <laughs> of that aspect off him and make him just like a bat you know like kind of dispensable you know just a mindless drone easy to destroy but if you've got lots if you've got enough of them they can overtake a position kind of thing but yeah never really gets explored which is a shame so as baron ironblood and the black major make preparations to escape muton approaches with the bomb ready to detonate when it gets close to the inhabitants of the island. And they're taking forever to leave, aren't they? There's a, if you know it's a super bomb, you need to get some distance between you, surely, before it went off. And they're just like, yeah, we'll just wait till he gets really close and then we'll leave. It's so weird. So M- Mutan must be quite a distance away from the Baron at this stage because in the panel, the, the, the Baron's speech bubble is a... Uh, Three Come months to later. <laughs> <laughs> Come to me, Muton. I am still one jump ahead of Action Force. In one hour, I wipe them and their hard-won island from the earth. So it's going to take an hour for Muton to get across the battlefield to where Iron Blood and the Black Major kind of camped out. Yeah, really weird. And with time running out, Sky Raider notices the extreme weather conditions near the island and contacts Q-Force with a plan to utilise the icy waters building up off the coast. And in turn, Q-Force pump the icy cold water and fire it towards Muton, freezing him and the bomb, rendering it useless. I have a few issues with this. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, this is not the way i expected it to go the story and yet this is the way they deal with this situation very odd way of doing it but quite an interesting way of dealing with it but odd the same way it's one of these things if they were trying to tie it in with some sort of you know climate change theme maybe it would kind of make sense but it still feels like something that you might see in one of these you know cartoons from yeah from back from, in the, from yeah. the time you yeah. know uh, like in, in scooby doo they might uh, freeze the, you know, freeze the bad guy yeah. with them um, with icy cold water. It's, totally. But even Scooby Doo as a comparator just feels like way off target for for this kind of story. It's it's a, it's a way of trying to bring a little bit more Q Force and Space Force into yes. the mix. I yes. suppose. Yes, it is. I suppose it, but with with Space Force noticing the situation in the first place, that makes them more important, and then Q Force delivering the killer blow that also makes it, you know, yeah, kind of brings them up a lot. The Q4 submarine, though, God, that needs to happen, doesn't it? Oh, look at that. I mean, that would be amazing. I'm going to check to see if there are any customs knocking about. I'm sure there are, but that needs to happen, I think. I think I need to do that. 
Jeez. Z Force and SAS Force clean up the remaining Red Shadow troops and the Black Major and Baron Ironblood escape using Action Force uniforms and slip away unnoticed. Ironblood has the final word, pledging a blood oath to rebuild his army and get vengeance over Action Force. Classic escape manoeuvre. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> and again, not the last time that we see uh, the bad guys escape and disguised as good guys they do it again and again and again yeah it's a good first story it's a good one establishes baron ironblood black major red shadows uh, as a real solid evil organization with means firepower and a very good recruitment policy i would have liked to have seen more action force backstory but I, you know i get why we haven't because of the time constraints the page panel constraints and all that kind of stuff uh, and obviously we do get it as we go on, as I said before, with Battle Action Force comics. But, you know, overall, I think it's a it's a nice, solid start. And it, it must have been good because it was so popular that it spurned Battle Action Force pretty much. Yeah, I mean, it, it, here's the thing. This is not the first or the last time that Battle had some content marketing for a product in its pages. Yeah. So in some of the comics I have, there's a kind of a sci-fi story that runs for about over six or seven issues yeah for for kp cosmic snacks <laughs> yes yes it's, it's pretty good it gets two pages every issue for for about seven eight weeks i and, loved um, i loved that when they did that with uh food like you know like kind of you know crisps and and all that kind of stuff that that was really cool actually because it even even to the point where I think Space Raiders had a comic on the back of it. Do you remember those? Yes, yes. So those Space Raiders, man, I must have cleaned out about, I don't know, 80, 83 metric tons of those over my time period of, of being a child uh, and a little bit as an adult. And they on the back, when you flipped it over, they would have these little comic strips on them about, you know, like space pirates. And uh, there was a female um, who I really want to do a... <laughs> I'll reword that really? i really want to do a custom of her uh like maybe using hacks pit parts because you can pretty much make her now with with like a lot of the, the stuff that the boss fight have come out with oh that you know what you've got to flash some pictures of oh the i will character. i will That's i absolutely great. will i absolutely will you know content marketing it was it was how you did it back in the day you may not have the budget for a tv show or couldn't get the funding for a yeah. tv show but you had comics Totally, and it was a totally. much more doable enterprise there. This was a huge hit. I mean, you had Action Man was a really popular, you know, brand and toy for Palatoy. Yeah. Action Force had been gaining momentum, you know, the year previous to this. And when this kind of hit the pages, it just I mean, the success was massive. They led up with the led in with the mini comics and then the complete rebrand, which ran then for, you know, through 84, 85 and, and 86 amazing i'm really sad i'm really upset i'm really sad as well i'm really upset that i wasn't around like i wasn't you know old enough to appreciate that as a kid when this was going on because i'd have loved to have seen this comic read this comic as it was out with the toys on the shelves and like that excitement that i had when i was doing the same thing with action force and gi joe later on like i just i think this would have been so much fun to read and in the moment and then be like oh there are toys out there as well let's let you know I, I must have them all kind of thing you know you know it's um what put this on on my radar was uh it was that the free action force figures that were given away around this time yes and one of the, the kids on my street had this like awesome action figure it was uh it was the z force radio operator i went wow, where'd you get this guy? I'd never even seen Action Force before. Yeah. And he said, yeah, they're, they're, it's free with the comic up in the in the local shop. So I hopped on my bike, went straight up there and bought the comic, got the figure and was hooked straight away. <laughs> the That is like the epitome of, of marketing at its finest right there, isn't it? And the fact that they do that nowadays with so many like it's so throwaway the amount of stuff that they kind of give you now that that wouldn't necessarily go down as like a great deal would it like that wouldn't be like a big deal nowadays but back then when we didn't have there were so many things we just we weren't privy to we didn't have our disposal so to have something so cool like a figure in with a magazine or a comic or something was mind-blowing 
and as as you know as like five point of articulation what have you it wasn't like getting like a gi joe figure or like a vitruvian hack on your <laughs> on your comic but my goodness it blew your mind as well that was it was just so cool as a kid for those kind of things do you know something that actually now is you make a really good point there with a lot of comics today a lot of the kids comics today you go into say the local tesco here there's a whole section on magazines and newspapers and they've got a little kids comic section every single comic has got a free toy baggied in the, the comic and the toy are all baggied into some printed up baggy yeah and they're all yeah. toys Oops, yeah. sorry, poopy toys okay it's um, fine it's fine it's junk. It's absolute junk in yeah. there. And, and the, the content, for the most part, in those comics is also junk. Whereas, compared that to the 1980s, getting an action figure. Like, these were you know, the best action figures on the market at that time yeah. in, in the UK and Ireland. Yeah, totally. So, we, it was a quality toy. The content within the comic was also amazing. The artwork was incredible. The writing was you know superb writing and i know there's a few things in this story that we've kind of pulled out as being kind of questionable or had a bit of a laugh at but for the most part the quality the quality of the the creative input into battle was top of its game fully agree in that industry at that time yeah i totally agree and uh yeah and that brings us to the end of another disorder of battle thank you brian for jumping on and chatting with me about action force the one that started it all i loved it absolutely loved it it was great we'll be coming back hardcore in your faces with some (laughs) with some more disorder of battles in the future and they're obviously going to be coming thick and fast which is nice we've already we've had about three in a couple of months that's uh that's already a record i think so, that's fantastic you know, not, not bad at all <laughs> i'm not sure which one we're doing next but obviously we'll 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 come to some agreement the two of us and we'll uh and give you a pretty cool story i'm not sure whether to do or to, to do some like mini disorder of battles brian when we look at the mini comics but do like you know very short bursty type episodes what do you think i don't, i think we should take a look at one of the mini comics because this is we've just kind of landed in a very nice era yeah. in the action force space and around this time the continuity was you know pretty held together really really well those first 12 months the creative team they tried not to overlap with the stories where mm. the bad guys were where the good guys were it maybe got a little bit less strict on the continuity you know from 1985 onwards but um starting between 83 and 84 the continuity was in a, in a really good place so i think we could just kind of hang out in this sort of early phase of, of the action force universe for a little while and, and have a play here totally so we'll there you go guys we'll do the mini comics next <laughs> <laughs> sorted uh anyway brian thanks for jumping on mate really appreciate it my pleasure that's it for this installment of disorder of battle thank you to my co-host brian hickey and to our sponsors dublin city comics and collectibles see you next time and as always blood for the baron full force <laughs> Blood for the Mouton. Moots for the Mouton is what I'm going to shout. Moots for the Mouton! <laughs> Make sure you get involved with the discussion by liking, sharing and commenting on these videos. And as always, you can keep up with the show after listening by following on Twitter at The Full Force, liking the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash The Full Force. And if you would like to contact the show, you can message us on either of those platforms with feedback or questions. We have also started a Patreon page, so if you want to see your name up in lights on these videos or enjoy exclusive bonus content, then check out patreon.com forward slash the Full Force podcast or click the link on any of the posts this podcast appears in. Full Force. And a big shout out to our sponsors, Dublin City Comics and Collectibles. Located at 46 Bolton Street, Inns Quay, Dublin 1, Ireland, you can visit their website at dublincitycomics.ie and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Dublin City Comics.